<laughs> Sorry, but there wasn't too much feedback there. How's everybody doing? Great to be with you on a Tuesday evening and learning together. That was Krasicha, part two. We started playing that song last night from Eitan Katz's second unplugged album. Let's light up the darkness. All right. <clears throat> Who's with us on a Tuesday evening? David in Indiana, Bella in Florida, Susie says hello, Annie in Michigan, Yehuda in South Carolina, Sharon in New Jersey, Stephen in New Hampshire, Paul in Chicago, Jose in Florida, Paula in the Great Northwest, John in Maine, Cecil in Arizona, Sandy in Michigan. Wait a minute, keep skipping on me. Uh, Karen is in Northern California, Carol in Cleveland, Renee in Indiana, Nancy in North Carolina, Aoife in Florida, Lynn in North Texas, Nancy in North Carolina, Patrice in Utah, Yitzhak in Kansas City. Welcome, everybody. Great doff today. Quick and punchy. So it's a pretty short one uh, with some beautiful and memorable teachings in it. Let's dive right in. This is chapter six of Tractate Yevamos, the 14th volume of the Talmud. We're on page 64 and today discussing Mishnah number eight here in chapter six. Generally speaking, the laws of Yibum, but once we got onto the subject of marriage and what makes a marriage and who has to stay married and who has to get married, the obligation to be fruitful and multiply, etc., it's all coming here in this chapter 6 of Tractate Yevamos. And that's why uh, this tractate, which it begins with so many complex laws uh, of who is obligated in levered marriage and which wives exempt their co-wives uh, because they have their own prohibited relationship with the Yavam, right? The Yavama is the widow. The Yavam is the, surve the surviving brother. When a man dies childless, that's a Yibum situation. But here in chapter 6, we're not talking about Yibum so much. We're talking more about marriage generally, the obligation to have children, etc. And as we've mentioned a few times, the obligation, the mitzvah, the commandment to be fruitful and multiply, peru urivu, is an obligation incumbent on men. Women are not obligated to bear children because there's danger in childbirth, but men are obligated. And today we'll see how that plays out, that men are obligated, but women are not. Mishnah number eight here in chapter six. <clears throat> if a man married a woman and stayed with her for 10 years and she did not give birth, he is no longer permitted to neglect the mitzvah to be fruitful and multiply. Consequently, he must either divorce her and marry someone else, or if he lives during a time when it is permitted to have two wives or more, he should take another wife while still married to his wife with whom he didn't have children for 10 years. And if he divorced her, she is permitted to marry another man, as it is not necessarily on her account that she and her first husband did not have children. And the second husband is permitted to stay with her for 10 years. And if she had a miscarriage, he counts the 10 years from the time of the miscarriage. Now, the question was asked a few days ago, well, look at somebody as holy and righteous as uh, the seventh Chabad Rebbe, the, the last Rebbe, there hasn't been one since, uh, when, so when people in Chabad say the Rebbe, they mean the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, uh, who was married to his wife for a very long time and they did not have children. So according to this Mishnah, uh, was he obligated uh, to end the marriage after 10 years and go marry someone else with, with whom he might have children? Now, let's read what the halacha is, the halacha, the law. If a man... So this is where the debate ended up, as it were. If a man remained with his wife for 10 years without having children, he must divorce her and pay her marriage contract in order to marry another woman who can bear children. Even if he does not want to divorce her, he is compelled to do so. Some commentaries say that if the man has already fathered a viable child, he is not compelled to divorce his wife, even if he has not fulfilled the mitzvah to be fruitful and multiply. The Rima adds that nowadays the custom 
is not to enforce the couple to divorce in any situation, right? So that's one of these cases where the law has evolved over these last couple thousand years. All right, now the Gemara on this Mishnah. The sage is taught, if a man married a woman and stayed with her for 10 years and she did not give birth, he should divorce her and pay her marriage contract because perhaps he did not merit to be built, i.e. to have children from her. Might not be any problem with her at all. Maybe he did not merit to have children with her, meaning it might be on his account that they didn't have children, either because... <clears throat> Uh, he was the one who was sterile and unable to have children in that couple or because he simply did not merit from heaven uh, to become pregnant in this uh, to be, that, that they should be that they should have a baby but on account of his shortcomings somehow he did not merit this or possibly because there's some physical incompatibility between them which is very interesting uh from a medical standpoint, it is possible for both a man and a woman to be fertile and yet be unable to have children together. This is modern science. Certain antibodies in the woman might destroy the sperm of a particular man and prevent pregnancy. Or the genetic combination of the two could create a situation in which the fetus dies before it has a chance to develop. But either of them would be, uh, you know, would be capable of having children with other partners. So, it is not certain that their failure to have children is due to her, as it is possible that they are not a suitable match for bearing children. Now, although there is no explicit proof for the matter that one must take another wife if he has not had children after 10 years of marriage, there is an allusion to the matter. As the verse states, Genesis 16:3. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar after Abram had dwelled 10 years in the land of Canaan and gave her to Abram, her husband, to be his wife. Right? So Abram and Sarai hadn't had children. They, they were very old when they finally had Yitzhak. He was 100 and she was 90. Uh, but during that time when they were waiting for that to happen and hoping that it would happen and eventually got frustrated that it wouldn't happen, so she gave uh, him her her slave, as it were, her handmaid, uh, Hagar, uh, thinking that, you know, he would father a children through Sarah's, Sarai's, because her name hadn't been changed to Sarah yet, through Sarai's servant, and therefore it's like the child would accrue to Sarah, but it ended up causing problems in the family, and the child of that union was Ishmael. So incidentally, this verse also comes to teach you that the years spent dwelling outside of the land of Israel do not count as part of his tally. <clears throat> so being married for 10 years and not having a child seems to only matter if you're living in the land of Israel during that period. Consequently, if he was sick during this period, or she was sick, or if one of the two of them was imprisoned in jail, it does not count as part of this 10-year tally. Rav said to Rav Nachman, let us derive from Yitzhak, right, Abraham, Abraham's son, <clears throat> excuse me, that one may wait a longer period of time, as it is written. And Yitzhak was 40 years old when he took Rivka, right, Rebecca, uh, to be his wife, Genesis 25, 20. And it is written with regard to the birth of Yaakov and Esau, Jacob and Esau. And Yitzhak was 60 years old when she bore them, Genesis 25, 26. So this indicates that one may wait 20 years. And Rav Nachman said to him, Yitzhak knew that he was infertile, and therefore there was no reason for him to marry another woman, as Rivka was not the cause of their infertility. And the Gemara responds, well, if so, Abraham also should have married another woman, as he was also infertile. Rather, the ton of our Mishnah requires that verse that states, when Yaakov and Esau were born, for that which Rabbi Chia Bar Abba taught. And this is because Rabbi Chia Bar Abba said, that Rabbi Yochanan said, why were Ishmael's years, right, the years of his life, how old he was, why were Ishmael's years counted in the Torah? as they do not appear to be relevant to its narrative, right? I mean, the, the story of the Jewish people, which is the Torah, 
uh, is through the line of Yitzhak, not Yishmael. So after Yishmael, you know, went off and did his own thing and actually became the father of the Arab people, what difference does it make how old he lived? He wasn't part of the narrative of the Jewish people. That's the question. Uh, so says Rabbi Yochanan, why were Ishmael's years counted in the Torah? In order to determine through them the age of Yaakov. Yaakov's age at the time that various events took place, as explained in Tractate Megillah. Right? When, we, when we were in Tractate Megillah, we covered uh, that using the years of sort of other relatives in the Torah, they were able to determine how old Jacob was at various times. And that's where we find this shortfall. Right? He spent 20 years by uh, Levan, Right, for, uh, seven years working allegedly for Rachel, another seven uh, when he realized that he was married to Leah and had to work seven more years to marry Rachel, uh, and then six years kind of working for his own merit uh, while tending Levon's sheep, but also creating his own herds. Uh, but there, he was actually away for 34 years through this calculation that was done, which involved Yishmael's age. And from that, we know that when Jacob left, uh, you know, his parents' house, Yitzhak and Rivka's house, after the incident of getting the blessing from Yitzhak uh, in place of Esau, uh, getting right Esau's blessing, um, that he spent a bunch of time before he even got to Levon's house, where? Studying Torah in the yeshiva of Shem and Haver. Right, so we learn that elsewhere. Okay, so the verse concerning Jacob's birth was not meant to allude to a law about remaining married before having children, but to make it possible to determine Jacob's age by relating it to the age of Yishmael. Rabbi Yitzhak said, Yitzhak, our father, was infertile. How do we know that? Why do, why do we assume that Yaakov was infertile? Why isn't it that maybe uh, Rachel and Leah were infertile? I'm sorry, why, how do we know that Yitzhak was infertile rather than Rivka? As it is stated, and Yitzhak entreated the Lord concerning Lenoichach, his wife, because she was barren. Sounds like she was barren. Where, where, how do you get, learn from this that Yitzhak entreated the Lord concerning his wife because she was barren? How do you learn from that that he himself was infertile? It is not stated that he entreated the Lord for his wife. Al, his wife, but Lenocha, concerning his wife, which can mean opposite or against or corresponding to. And because that was the preposition used to introduce that his prayer was for his wife, this teaches, <clears throat> excuse me, that both of them were infertile. And the Gemara asks, if so, why does the verse continue? And the Lord let himself be entreated of him. The verse should say, and the Lord let himself be entreated of them. And the Gemara answers that their prayers were answered due to Yitzhak. Because the prayer of a righteous individual who is the son of a righteous individual is not similar to the prayer of a righteous individual who is the son of a wicked individual. And Rivka's father was the wicked Levant. Right? So... It's not that, you know, if you, if you happen to be born of wicked people, that your prayers won't be heard. Uh, they will be heard, but they won't have as much oomph as the prayers of a righteous person who's also the child of a righteous person. So Rabbi Yitzchak said, for what reason? This is a very famous teaching here in the Talmud. It gets cited often. Rabbi Yitzchak said, for what reason were our forefathers initially infertile? Because the Holy One, blessed be He, desires the prayers of the righteous. And He therefore wanted them to pray for children. Right? We see this with Abraham, that he and Sarah couldn't have kids for a long time. We see it with Yitzhak, that he and Rivka couldn't have kids for a long time. And we see it with Jacob and Rachel, that Rachel wasn't able to bear children for a long time, even though her sister Leah was popping them out right and left. Uh, but this idea that God desires the prayers of the righteous, this is not only with regards to fertility issues, 
but generally, you know, you find very, very righteous people in this world are suffering, right? We don't see any kind of quid pro quo where the righteous are rewarded in this world for all their righteous deeds uh, and that the wicked are all punished in this world for all their wicked deeds. It seems sometimes that there's no justice. Of course, we believe that we are all souls we are eternal beings, right, made of, of, of soul energy, as it were. We come from the world of souls. We're on earth for a finite amount of time, and then we return to the world of souls. So there's, you know, more than ample time available in the world to come for us to get our full reward for all our righteous deeds and to be held accountable for all of our transgressions. Nonetheless, uh, when we see that the, suff- the, the righteous often not just don't get rewarded, but are even suffering in this world, one of the teachings related to that is this idea that, that God desires the prayers of the righteous. Uh, why, would, why would God want that? Because when righteous people pray, it's like they're closer to God, right? Righteous people already, people who love God, fear God, desire relationship with God, and when they're spending more time prayer, you know, God, God relishes that prayer. Uh, and so, you know, to grow in righteousness and to grow in closeness to God and ultimately perhaps to be rewarded, uh, pray, you know, pray. The more time we spend in prayer, the better, uh, even if only to create that relationship with the Holy One, blessed be He. The more time we spend in prayer talking to God, the better. Obviously not, you know, there's limits. You shouldn't prolong prayer like you're spending all day long in prayer. No one said to be an ascetic monk, but to pray regularly three times a day like a man is obligated to do or twice a day like a woman is obligated to do, it's a good thing. Okay, Rabbi Yitzhak said, for what reason were our forefathers initially fertile? Because the Holy One, blessed be He, desires the prayers of the righteous, and He therefore wanted them to pray for children. Similarly, Rabbi Yitzhak said, why are the prayers of the righteous compared to a pitchfork, etter, as in the verse, and He let Himself be entreated, vaya etter, God allowed Himself to be entreated. This indicates that just as this pitchfork is turns over produce from one place to another, right? That's why you, we use a pitchfork for if you're drying grass in the sun so that it should become hay, you're going to use the pitchfork to turn it over, right? And this idea metaphorically that the prayers of the righteous can change God's decree. God will allow, you know, his, 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 his mind to be changed as it were, by the prayers of the righteous. The prayers of the righteous have the power of a pitchfork in this sense to turn over a decree. Uh, This indicates that just as this pitchfork turns over produce from one place to another, so the prayer of the righteous turns over the attributes of the Holy One, blessed be He, from the attribute of rage to the attribute of mercy. And Rabbi Ami said, Abraham and Sarah were originally tomb to men. Right? Recall, we've discussed this. There's four genders mentioned in the Talmud. Male, female, andrigonos, and tomb tomb. Male and female, we understand. Uh, the andrigonos is a, is a person who has the sexual characteristics of both male and female, uh, sometimes referred to as a hermaphrodite. And the tomb tomb uh, is one who has neither the sexual organs of male or female, not because they don't possess them, but because it's covered up in some way. Uh, right? And so, so according to this teaching, Rabbi Ami said Abraham and Sarah were originally tomb tombs, people whose sexual organs are concealed and not functional. As it is stated, look to the rock. Now we're on 64B. Look to the rock from where you were hewn and to the hole of the pit from where you were dug. Isaiah 51.1. And it is written in the next verse, look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you, which indicates that sexual organs were fashioned for them, signified by the words hewn and dug over the course of time. It's like they didn't have their sexual organs when they were young, but they emerged later, or they didn't have access to their sexual organs until they emerged later. So Rav Nachman said that Rabbi Bar Abu said, our mother Sarah was initially a sexually underdeveloped woman, an alonis, right? We've discovered, discussed an alonis, 
uh, for example, is not permitted for a Yavam to perform Yibum with an Elonis. This is a woman who is, you know, has phys- is, it's clear physically that she will never be fertile uh, because she's underdeveloped in some way, uh, you know, that, that, that is overt. Uh, and so this is obvi- obviously these opinions and, you know, I guess it's worth mentioning all the time that the Talmud doesn't speak in one voice, right? You don't say the Talmud says. People often use that as shorthand, but it's not so. There are many voices in the Talmud, and that's why you always have to be careful that you don't paskin halacha from the Gemara. It's, it's not unclear what the law finally is, uh, and that's why we look to a collection of halachas like Shulchan Aruch, uh, when we want to know, well, what is the law that we follow? Or here in the Koran, it's a nice set of notes in the margins that tells you what the halacha is. So this opinion about Sarah, about Abraham and Sarah, obviously uh, contradicts the opinion of Rabbi Ami. Rabbi Ami said that they were both tomb tombs, um, and right. Uh, and now Rav Nachman, in the name of Rabbi, Rabbi Bar Abu, said Sarah was an Elonis. As it is stated, Genesis 11.30, and Sarah was barren, she had no child. Now, the, super, super, the superfluous words, she had no child, once you said that she's barren, why do we need to know that she has no child? It's obvious. So the superfluous words, she had no child, indicate that she did not have even a place, i.e. a womb, for a child. Rav Yehuda, the son of Rav Shmuel Bar Shelah, said, in the name of Rav, they taught that he waits 10 years only with regard to the people who lived in former generations, whose years were numerous, i.e. they lived longer. However, with regard to the people who live in later generations and whose years are few, I mean, if you compare us, Abraham lived to 175, Methuselah lived to 969 years, you know, and we have, uh, as, as, uh, as, as Psalm says, and it's going to be referred to momentarily, you know, the average age, now it's getting higher, uh, but, but, you know, from recent centuries, the average age was 70 at most and have granted great vigor, 80, you know, in, communi- in communities where there was a lot of disease or famine, etc. The, the, you know, the mean survival age could be even much lower. So then, so, you know, people are dying much younger than they did in previous generations. You could see why that 10 year limit might need to be modified. Right. So that is what Rav Yehuda is arguing here. Uh, however, with regard to people who live in later generations whose years are few, he waits only two and a half years before divorcing his wife, corresponding to the time period of three pregnancies. Rav has said in the name of Rav Nachman, he waits three years, corresponding to the three remembrances of barren women by God. As the master said on Rosh Hashanah, Sarah, Rachel, and Hannah, Hannah, the mother of Shmuel, the prophet Shmuel, were remembered, i.e. God gave them children at Rosh Hashanah. Since God determines on Rosh Hashanah whether barren women will conceive in the coming year, one may remain married until three such opportunities have passed. That's one opinion. However, Rabbah himself said, these principles are not accepted as halacha. Why not? Now consider who established the content of the Mishnah. Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Yet in the days of King David, many years before the time of Rebbe, the years of an average lifespan were already diminished. As it is written, the days of our years are 70 years, and if one with strength, 80 years. That's Psalm 90. Consequently, if Rebbe included in the Mishnah the statement that one remains married for 10 years, well, that should apply nowadays as well. And the Gemara asks about the language of the Baraisa. And what about this expression? Perhaps he did not merit to be built for her. Perhaps it was she who did not merit to build a family. And the Gemara answers, she, since she is not commanded to be fruitful and multiply, she is not punished. Her merit does not, re- does not regulate whether she has a child or not. That's not about her merit. It's only the man who's obligated to be fruitful and multiply and who, because of some kind of shortcomings, perhaps in this life, perhaps in a previous life, you know, it's like you can't look at people that are having misfortune and say to them or say to yourself about them, they must have done something wrong to merit this misfortune. That is a huge mistake, and it's the mistake that the friends of Job made. We never speculate like that uh, about other people's misfortune, why it's happening to them. We only try to comfort them. About ourselves, you know, when we're experiencing misfortunes, 
not the worst thing to examine our deeds and see if there's some area where we could do better. But it's not that we should be blaming ourselves either and adding to the stress of such a situation. Uh, so, so we, so at any rate, if a woman doesn't have children, you don't even discuss whether she merited to have children or not. You only have that discussion about men. So the Gemara challenge is the Mishnah statement that if one did not have children after 10 years, he should marry a different woman. Is that so? Didn't the sages say to Rabbi Abba Bar Zavda, marry a woman and have children. And he said to them, if I had merited, I would already have children from my first wife. <clears throat> and this indicates that there is no obligation to remarry if one did not have children with his first wife. And the Gemara answers, there Rabbi Abba Bar Safta was merely putting the rabbis off with an excuse as the real reason why he uh, would not marry was because Rabbi Abba Bar Zafta had become impotent. How did he become impotent? We've actually seen this before. Because of Rav Huna's classes. God, I hope I'm never <laughs> accused of such a thing. Uh... Why were Rav Huna's classes making his students impotent? Because they were very long and nobody wanted to miss a word that Rav Huna was saying and they would hold back from relieving him themselves until his lengthy sermons were finished and this caused them to become sterile. And the Gemara similarly relates that Rav Giddel became impotent from Rav Huna's d- discourse. And Rav Chalbo became impotent from Rav Huna's discourse. And Rav Sheshis became impotent from Rav Huna's discourse. And the Gemara relates, Rav Achabar Yaakov was afflicted by Suchinta, a disease caused by holding back from urinating. They suspended him from the cedar column that supported the study hall. And a substance that was as green as a palm leaf emerged from him and he was healed. Rav Achabar Yaakov said, We were 60 elders present at that time, and they all became impotent from Rav Huna's discourse aside from me. Why was I different? As I fulfilled with regard to myself the verse, Wisdom preserves the life of he who has it. Ecclesiastes 7.12 Meaning, I used the above cure to avoid becoming impotent. They were all sages in Rav Huna's class. Why didn't the others look to that wisdom? Doesn't explain. It was taught in the Mishnah that if a man divorced his wife after 10 years without children, she is permitted to marry a second man who may remain married to her for 10 years. And the Gemara comments, a second husband, yes, but a third one, no. Once she has been married to two men without children for 10 years each, then it is presumed that she is unable to have children and another man doesn't have to, you know, should not come along and marry her. And the Gemara comments, who is the ton of the Mishnah? It is, Rabbi, it is Rabbi, who holds that a legal presumption, a chazaka, is established after two occurrences. This is a very important Talmudic principle. It's going to come up many times, particularly uh, when we get into Bava Kama, Bava Mitzia, the laws of contracts. Uh, but this idea that if something gets repeated twice, it creates a legal presumption that it will happen again and you have to take it into account uh, when you're making a heshbon, when you're making an accounting, you know, what, what something's going to be worth, whether it should be bought or not, or in this case, whether somebody should marry this woman. As we'll see, there's disagreement whether two instances creates the chazaka, the presumption that it will happen again, or three instances creates the chazaka, as we'll see. Uh, so the Gemara comments, who is the Tan of the Mishnah? It is Rabbi who holds that a Chazak is established after two occurrences. As it is taught in a Baraisa, if a woman circumcised her first son and he died as a result of the circumcision, and she circumcised her second son and he also died as a result of the circumcision, so she should not circumcise her third son as the deaths of the first two produce a presumption that this woman's sons die as a result of circumcision. This is the statement of Rabbi. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel said she should circumcise her third son, as there is not considered to be a chazaka that her sons die from circumcision uh, until three have died. But she should not circumcise her fourth son if the first three died, right? So Shimon ben Gamliel would say, if, if it happens three times, then there's a chazaka. Rebbe says twice, right? So Rebbe says two times create a chazaka. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel says three times create a chazaka. Now the Gemara asks, isn't the reverse taught in a baraisa? 
that Rebbe holds that the woman's third son must be circumcised and Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel holds that he is not circumcised, which of them was composed later and is therefore presumed to be the more reliable statement of which of them holds which way? The Gemara suggests, come in here. As Rabbi Chia bar Abba said that Rabbi, Rabbi Yochanan said, an incident occurred involving four sisters in Sipori. That the first sister circumcised her son and he died. And the second sister circumcised her son and he died. And the third one circumcised her son and he too died. The fourth sister came before Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel who said to her, do not circumcise. And this indicates that according to Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel, a presumption is established after three occurrences, like the first version that we heard. But the Gemara refutes this proof. Perhaps if the third sister had come before Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel and asked him, he would also have said to her the same ruling. And the Gemara asks, well, if so, what is the purpose of Rabbi Chia bar Abba's testimony? Why would, he be relate- Why would he have told us this incident if it does not teach us anything? And the Gemara answers, well, perhaps he comes to teach us that sisters establish a presumption in a case like this even though the children who died were not from the same mother, that you can establish a chazaka for women from the same family in the way that you would establish a chazaka for one woman and her children. Rava said, now that you have said that sisters establish a chazaka, a man should not marry a woman from a family of epileptics or from a family of lepers, as these diseases might be hereditary. And the Gemara adds, and this applies only if it was established three times, i.e. three members of the family are afflicted with the disease, then, you know, you might not want to marry into that family. And the Gemara asks, which halachic conclusion was about this matter? Where did they end up? Is the Chazak established with two instances, like Rebbe says, or three, like Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel seems to say? And Rabbi Yitzhak bar Yosef came from Eretz Yisrael, and he said, an incident occurred before Rabbi Yochanan in the synagogue of the town of Ma'on, on Yom Kippur that occurred on Shabbos. So it was a Yom Kippur that landed on Shabbos. And the first sister had circumcised her son and he died. The second sister circumcised her son and he also died. The, the third sister came before him and, and he said to her, go and circumcise your son as a presumption is not established after only two occurrences. So it seems like Rabbi Yochanan holds, like Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, that you establish a hazaka with three instances, not two. Abaye said to Rabbi Yitzhak, see to it that your report is accurate, as you are permitting an action that would otherwise constitute a prohibition and a danger. If the third baby should not be circumcised because the hazaka is actually established after two instances, then telling her to go ahead and circumcise would be a prohibited labor on Shabbos, right? Not only are you telling her to circumcise a child that might be endangered from it, but you're also telling her to do it on Shabbos and Yom Kippur, by the way, uh, where if there is any kind of danger, we would never do it, right? We would never do it if there's a danger. We would never do it, period, but especially we're not going to do it on Shabbos. On Shabbos, in fact, we violate Shabbos in order to save someone from a danger. But if there's a doubt that there might be a danger, that would be a reason not to do this obligation and wait and see. So the Gemara comments, Abaye relied on this report and he went and married Chuma, the daughter of Issi, the son of Rav Yitzchak, the son of Rav Yehuda. Chuma had previously married Rechava of Pumbedisa, and he died. And then Chuma married Rav Yitzchak, the son of Rabba Bar- Barchana, and he died. And he, Abaye, married her nevertheless. Right? He said, okay, well, the Hazaka uh, is not established by the fact that her previous two husbands died. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to marry her. What happened? He married her without concern that she had been established to be a woman whose husbands died. And... Abaye died. Abaye also died while he was married to her. So Rava said, is there anyone who performs an action like this and endangers himself by marrying such a woman? Wasn't it he, Abaye, who said that Avin is reliable, but Yitzchak the Red, i.e. Rav Yitzchak bar Yosef, is not reliable? And he proceeds to explain the difference between them. Avin returns to Eretz Yisrael, to the land of Israel, and he hears whether the sages there rescind their previous rulings, whereas Yitzhak the Red 
does not return to the land of Israel and he never finds out if the sages there have rescinded their rulings. And furthermore say that they disagree with regard to whether a presumption is established by two or by three deaths regarding circumcision. But do they necessarily argue with regard to marriage? Right? With regard to marriage, are we going to have the same... Is, is a chazaka always a chazaka based on two instances or on three instances? Or maybe a chazaka can be based on two instances when it involves death, uh, but it won't be, in, but it'll be involved in, it, it'll require three instances when it's something, you know, less, less catastrophic. Or perhaps there's a different ruling of what establishes a chazaka in the realm of marriage, you know, marrying a woman whose husbands have died. Maybe that's a different finding than whether a woman circumcises a third or a fourth child after the first two or three uh, babies died from the circumcision. Obviously a super rare thing. You know, we've been circumcising Jewish males uh, for thousands of years and it, you know, it almost never happens. But you know, the one in a million can happen. Uh, and then if you see, if one in a million happens, not once but twice, I, I think the parents would be very hesitant to circumcise the third child, at least on the eighth day. Maybe they would just wait till much later. Uh, where am I? So the Gemara responds, yes, yes, circumcision and marriage are the same with, res- with respect to the definition of a chazaka. Yes, and it is taught in a Baraisa, if a woman was married to her first husband and he died, to a second one and he also died, she may not get married to a third husband. This is the statement of Rebbe. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel says, she may get married to a third husband, but if he also dies, she may not get married to a fourth husband. So that's the, the way it was originally defined, the difference. Rebbe established the Chazak after two deaths and Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel only after three deaths. And the Gemara asks, granted, with regard to circumcision, a presumption of death due to circumcision can be established because there are families whose blood is thin and it does not clot well. And there are families whose blood does clot. However, in the case of marriage, what is the reason for concern that a subsequent husband will die? Right? Why would, you know, being married to a certain woman kill men? We're assuming that she's not some kind of murderess. It's not because she's killing them, uh, but somehow it's like she's cursed, like her husbands die. What what is it? Is it something physical or something else? So Rav Mordechai said to Rav Ashi, Avimi of Hagronia said in the name of Rav Huna as follows, her spring is the cause. In other words, the woman has some sort of condition that causes those who have intercourse with her to die. But Rav Ashi said, that her constellation is the cause of her husband's deaths. Uh, Her constellation is the cause of her husband's deaths. So here's a note, here's a halachic note about that. Where did the law end up on this subject? If a woman was married or betrothed twice and her husband's died, she may not marry a third time as there is a presumption that she was the cause of her husband's deaths. However, if a third man did marry her, he is not required to divorce her. Even if he has only betrothed her, he may marry her. If he was not aware of her previous history and he wants to divorce her due to the fact that her previous husbands died, he is not required to pay her marriage contract. The Rima writes that some authorities rule in accordance with the opinion that her spring is the cause, meaning that somehow having intercourse with her kills the men. And therefore, the presumption that she is the cause of her husband's deaths is established only when they died on their own. However, if they died in accidents or due to an epidemic, so then no presumption is established. Therefore, many are lenient in regard to this law and no objection to their practice is raised. Right. So there's a cause for concern but even if you're you know you you meet a woman and fall in love with her and she has buried two husbands you might think twice about marrying her but you're permitted to marry her uh so th- I, I mean you'd want to research this law more carefully but it seems like that's where it finally came out like it seems like the law says you shouldn't but if you did you can stay married to her so the gemara asks what is the practical difference between them the practical difference with whether somehow her spring is the cause of the the husbands to die or her constellation. I'm very close to being done. So if you have questions or comments, get them in. 
What is the practical difference between them? The Gemara answers, there is a difference between them in a case where a man betrothed her and died before the wedding. So he never had intercourse with her. It can't be that her spring is killing her husband. Uh, alternatively, in a case where he fell off a palm tree and died. Uh, so if the concern is due to intercourse, in these case, and then in these cases, the husband's death cannot be attributed to the wife. Conversely, if the concern is due to her bad fortune, right, her constellation means that she's unlucky and her husband seemed to die on her, uh, her mazel, right, her mazel, her stars are not aligned well for her. Uh, so conversely, the concern is due to her bad fortune. So the husband's death can be attributed to his wife, even in these cases. Rav Yosef, the son of Rava, said to Rava, I inquired of Rav Yosef whether the law is in accordance with the opinion of Rebbe, and he said to me, yes, meaning two instances established the Chazaka. I subsequently asked him if the halacha is in accordance with the opinion of Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel, and he said to me, yes, which would mean that the Chazaka is established after three. So says Rav Yosef, was he mocking me by issuing contradictory rulings? So Rava said to him, right, so it seems that uh, so Rav Yosef, the son of Rava, inquired of Rav Yosef, right? So there's two Rav Yosefs. One is Rav Yosef, the son of Rava, and the other is the famous Rav Yosef. So Rav Yosef, the son of Rava, says to his father, I ask the famous Rav Yosef, is the law in accordance with Rebbe, that Chazak is established after two instances? Yes. Then I asked him, is the halacha in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel? That chazak is established after three instances. And Rabbi Yosef said, yes. So now he's asking Rava, his father, was he mocking me? Rava said to him, no. There are unattributed Mishnayos in accordance with each opinion. Right? This, is why, this is why you have to be so careful when you're reading the Mishnah, you're reading the Gemara, and it's something seems to be stated as a, you know, agreed upon law, the final conclusion of law, because it might not be the final conclusion of law. And that's why you're going to look to somebody like Ramba, Maimonides in his Mishnah Torah, Shulchan Aruch, to find out what exactly is the law. So Rav said, no, there are unattributed Mishnahs in accordance with each opinion. And he resolved for you that the law is in accordance with each opinion in particular cases. So with regard to marriage and lashings, floggings, the halacha is in accordance with the opinion of Rebbe, uh, that two occurrences are sufficient for a presumption. Concerning set patterns of menstrual bleeding and a forewarned ox, right? So when do we know that an ox uh, that is a dangerous ox, right? If an ox breaks out of its pen and injures somebody, that was not foreseeable. If it breaks out of its pen again and injures somebody, uh, that was still not foreseeable. And the, the, you know, the owner isn't declared negligent if he just had a regular fence around that ox. So if he breaks out a third time, now, it, and it hurts somebody or kills somebody, now the owner is, is understood to be liable for damages or even for murder if the ox kills somebody. Now, is that true after two instances? that the ox, you know, hurt somebody, or three. Uh, so it would seem that here, uh, Rava is saying that in the case of the forewarned ox and uh, a set pattern of menstrual bleeding, the halakha is in accordance with the opinion of Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel. It's a more lenient opinion with vis-a-vis -vis the owner of the ox that it has to, you know, break out and cause damage three times before it enters the class of the ox that we know is a danger to society and that the owner either you know locks it up in a steel cage or kills it so that it won't hurt anyone again that's where we're going to break off uh, we're right at the bottom of 64b where we'll pick it up again tomorrow let's go to questions and comments on page 64 <clears throat> Uh, Rene, Ata Dumia Tehila, to you silence is praise. It's a great mantra. Beautiful. Beautiful, right? I guess uh, in answer to uh, talking about earlier that God desires the prayers of the righteous, and there's different forms of prayer, uh, and sometimes silence is praise. It's a, it's a really beautiful teaching. That line is from a psalm, right? Um, 
and you know that can that can take a lot of meanings. Uh, one is that you accept God's degree decrees in this world, you know, and trust God that even though things seem to be very bleak and not going well today, you don't complain uh, because you trust God. Uh, it can mean other things as well. Tom, we should really examine ourselves during periods of good fortune. I love it. I love it, right? So in, in, in this idea that when things are going badly, we should be examining our own deeds to see where we can do better. And likewise, we should be examining our deeds when things are going well, both to see what was it that I've been doing well. Maybe I'm being rewarded for it. But also, maybe I, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate right now, but who knows how long this fortune will last. And I better always be examining my deeds to see how I can do more to be Peru, right? To be fruitful in this world. This is something I always like to, you know, think about for myself. I mean, you know, thank God, uh, you know, we're very blessed. We've had children, uh, but we still have to ask ourselves, what is my soul's mission in this world? What is the unique thing that only I can give the world? And am I working hard and efficient and diligent enough uh, you know, in, in, in doing for God's children everything that I can. Bill, but isn't it the law that there is no mazel for Israel, that the stars do not bind Israelites the way they do other nations? Correct. That is definitely a teaching that we've encountered before and will encounter again. Um, and so you don't need to trust in, you never should trust in astrologers, etc., uh, certainly in terms of the nation as a whole and even for individuals. Uh, and generally speaking, that's probably true for all people, not just Jews. You know, don't put too much stock in astrology. There is Jewish astrology, without a doubt. Uh, and there is this idea of mazel, right? And we say mazel tov to people, you know, when, uh, when something has gone well for them. We translate that as congratulations, but we mean God has smiled on you. God has arranged the stars for you. So what it means that uh, Israel is not bound to muzzle, to mazel, right, to the constellations, is this idea that prayer can break through, right? So there is some kind of, you know, an order uh, that kind of God's bounty comes into this world, you know, through some kind of an arrangement uh, of the celestial spheres, as it were. And there's a, you know, a trend the way things are going in our lives. Uh, but prayer can break right through that. So that's what it means that people don't have muzzle. So with regard to this woman, you know, there's this tragic hypothetical case where she has, you know, buried two or even three husbands, uh, you know, should a man marry her, he might think twice about doing it. But as we've seen, if he does marry her, we're not going to make him divorce her. Right. And it might be that he's thinking, you know, that with his prayer and her prayer and whatever, you know, new things are happening in, the, in their lives, that they're going to break through that mazel and they're not going to be concerned about it. So maybe that's, uh, you know, in play in that instance. Um, uh, so Nina is telling me there was some discussion about a baby who dies after circumcision and refers to hemophilia. Correct. Rather than a bad moil. Well, it, that's what the Talmud seem to be saying, right? That some families have thin blood. And I think what they mean by that is some kind of hemophilia, some kind of bleeding disease uh, that would make it very dangerous uh, for a child to be circumcised, particularly in its eighth day of life. And they might be much better off waiting till much later. Right? I mean, in the, in the Muslim faith, uh, I believe they don't circumcise until a, a, a boy is 13 years old. Right? They do it at a completely different stage of life. Uh, you know, with Jews, if, if there tragically is that circumstance, that circumcision resulted in the deaths of uh, two babies, uh, you know, they might end up circumcising the child, but they might wait, who knows, a month, a year. I, I, I don't know the particulars of that. This was just used as, as an example here uh, once the issue of Chazaka came up. But Chazaka came up much more in the discussion uh, of, you know, if, if they didn't have children, should he go marry someone else? Uh, and, you know, if the woman has buried husbands, should he go marry someone else? All right. Yeah, you know, it, it, I really want to be sensitive that when we're learning these kinds of subjects, you know, I'm sure that there are people in our class or loved ones of people in our class who have endured terrible misfortunes. 
uh, and it must be painful to hear these subjects. Um, so, you know, my, my heart goes out to you if, if you're in a situation like that or you're thinking of people who are in a situation like that. And, you know, we just remember again that unless they're talking about a specific incident, generally these discussions are hypothetical. Uh, what they're just trying to analyze is what is the law. Uh, but compassion in teaching the law, compassion in applying the law is a huge, huge value uh, in Jewish tradition. And let's not forget that. Okay, my friends, that's what I've got for us today. With God's help, we'll be together again tomorrow, Wednesday night, the regular